I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the ongoing research that I've been doing for the last couple of years. In the same way that John and Vladimir have been talking a little bit about kind of the knowledge generation that they've been doing, I want to just briefly talk about some of the research that I've been doing in recent years on um, basically how do you improve social standards, social, how do you basically promote social sustainability in global uh, supply chains. Now, why is that? Um, why is that interesting? So what we know is that globalization uh, has led to an incredible dispersion of production all over the world, and that's created all sorts of opportunities uh, for development. But at the same time, that's created all sorts of challenges in terms of labor standards, excess work hours, uh, child labor, et cetera. And the question is, what, if anything, can be done to resolve those problems, and how can you basically do something that will at the same time maintain, perhaps even enhance the profitability um, of companies, unless it's integrated within the basic business line, uh, uh, the bottom line of business, we know it's not going to be sustainable. Now what's interesting is notwithstanding that it's very common knowledge that there are all sorts of problems uh, in these supply chain factories, the ways that people have tried to tackle these problems will either, for example, expecting governments to enforce the laws on their books. What we know is almost all of the countries in which these new sites of production take place, they have on their books incredible labor and environmental laws, et cetera. The problem is that those laws are not enforced, and they're not enforced either because the governments don't have the capability to enforce them, they don't have the manpower, they don't have the budget, et cetera, or they don't have the will or some sort of combination. We also know that there's all sorts of global institutions like the ILO or let's say the United Nations Global Compact where companies sign on to principles or countries sign on to principles and yet once again there is no enforcement mechanism to get countries to basically abide by those principles or companies to actually demonstrate uh, that they are abiding by say the UN Global Compact. And so what's emerged as the dominant way in today's world to try to somehow improve labor standards, social standards, even environmental standards in many of these glo global supply chain factories is a compliance model. And the compliance model is basically uh, where individual companies uh, embrace a voluntary code of conduct, then they develop a series of sort of monitoring efforts and reporting efforts to try to see if their suppliers are complying with that voluntary code of conduct. And then they develop a series of corrective action plans to see like, all right, so you're not doing it. What are you going to do uh, uh, to improve things? And it's basically a policing mechanism. It's basically, let me check on you to see if you're doing the right thing. And if you're not, I'll threaten you. I don't know how often I'll actually uh, execute that threat. But it, it's a very, very negative system. And unfortunately, that is the dominant way that both companies and NGOs are seeking to tackle these very serious issues. And so what we did in this research project is to try to understand, basically, how effective is this system? Under what conditions does it work? And if it doesn't work, what else might work? And that's what this project is all about. And so what we've been doing over the last couple of years is working with an array of different companies in different industries. So we looked at footwear, apparel, um, agriculture. We're now beginning a project in uh, electronics. And we're looking at lead buyers and their supply chain and trying to basically understand um, how effective are their compliance programs. And so what they, these companies have given us, are uh, they've shared with us all sorts of data, their compliance data, their sourcing data, et cetera. So we've done some analyses of these data as well as grounded field research. So with teams of MIT students, we've gone to visit factories uh, in Brazil, China, India, Bangladesh, uh, Turkey, a variety of Central American uh, uh, countries, uh, as well as uh, in Southeast Asia and in the United States. It's incredibly important not just to look at the data, but to go in and see what's happening on the ground and do interviews. And I would say that this project that we've been doing, which is really a neutral, fact-based, analytical approach, is in many ways quite innovative for this kind of uh, uh, research. So what did we find? I'm going to talk about two cases. 
The first one is Nike. Everyone knows that Nike was embroiled in all sorts of issues around labor standards and child labor and excess work hours, et cetera. And so we did a project with Nike where they shared with us all of their factory audits. So we had data for over 900 factories distributed in 51 countries from the time they started doing their monitoring, which is around 1998, until 2005 when they shared with us uh, their data. And after analyzing these data and all sorts of other independent data that we were able to collect, what did we see? The graph in front of you is basically a graph of the results of one of their audits. This is, in fact, the most systematic audit that's trying to basically uh, show how good or bad are factories in terms of their treatment of workers. And if you're on the uh, close to the one, which is really 100, that means 100% uh, in compliance, which means it's an indicator of good working conditions. And if you're on the left-hand side, uh, it's an indicator of poor working conditions. And what this shows you, basically, is using the company's own data, which, by the way, they hadn't systematically analyzed, and one of the things we did is organize it and analyze it uh, for them, what we see is that there's a normal distribution. Some of the suppliers are actually treating their workers uh, relatively well. Others, far from it, many in between. And if we parse out these data by geography or by sector, et cetera, we would still get more or less that kind of normal distribution. This is important to know because this shows us that not all suppliers are sweatshops nor all of them are actually complying to the code of conduct. There's a lot of stuff going in between, and we wanted to try to understand what explains that variation, and also, are things getting better over time? That's the thing that we really uh, cared about. So we continued to do research, and one of the things we did is, over time, track using the same tools, often um, that uh, Nike has an internal auditing staff, so it was the same people doing the same audits of the same factories, were things improving over time? Using this same tool, the M audit, which is only one of their audits, what we see is over time, uh, of the factories that had been audited by the same person using the same tool, uh, uh, et cetera, there was basically a 5% improvement in their performance. Now, depending on what kind of person you are, you might think 5% is a lot, you might think 5% is not enough. Uh, what we know is that that's just what their own data are indicating. It's in the right direction, even though we would argue that for all the kinds of investments and resources and time and people, maybe it's not enough uh, for what they want. Another indicator is uh, Nike, like so many other companies, doesn't just have numerical audits, but they have color codes, you know, green, red, orange, or letter grades, A, B, C, uh, meaning A is you're really in good shape and D is, you know, you're really in bad shape and we shouldn't be working with you. And these were publicly available data. And what this shows is if A is really excellent and B is pretty good, but you have some minor problems, C is you have more serious problems, but you have a good attitude, you look like you want to work towards it, and D is really bad problems we should not be sourcing. What uh, this uh, bar graph shows is that over, first, shows two things. First of all is that 50% of Nike suppliers are B, which I think is uh, indicative of why on average they perform quite well. But it also shows that over time we would like to see greater A's uh, and B's uh, and less C's and D's and we're not seeing that. In fact, uh, we're seeing uh, a growth of the C and D's. And if we actually look at uh, 763 of their factories, and what we did is we compared from the very first time they got a grade to the very last time they got a grade, and you'll see that over 40% of their supply base saw no improvement, no change. And another 30-odd percent, the top three rows, showed a deterioration of conditions. So what this suggests is that for a company like Nike that has all the interests in the world because of the boycotts, because of the media, because of all sorts of things, to try to improve its conditions. For a company that spends $11 million a year just on auditing, that has hired 100 people and dispersed them all over the world just to do this, they're not necessarily getting the bang for their buck in terms of trying to improve the working conditions in their suppliers using this particular um, approach. A second company, we'll call it ABC, because they've asked us not to reveal their name, but that's a major global corporation. 
garment uh, corporation. It's actually, unlike Nike, which was seen in many ways as sort of a bad boy of corporate social responsibility, ABC is seen as one of the leading companies in the United States uh, in terms of corporate responsibility. It's held up as a real uh, leader by all sorts of um, organizations. Uh, it sources, it used to have its own factories, but now it sources uh, um, to over a, a thousand factories in 68 uh, countries. And uh, we went to study them, and they invited us to study them because they had a reputation of doing all the right things. When we looked more closely at their supply, again, this is their own data. We're not inventing this. When we looked at their own data, what, it, what we found was that 53% of their total suppliers were not approved by their own human rights, uh, so the human rights program is their own compliance program, and they have a policy that says we do not source from any companies that haven't been approved, and when we looked at their own data, what we saw is that 53% of them, uh, of course, geographically more concentrated in Asia than, of course, in the Americas, um, were um, actually actively supplying for this company, even though they did not pass the human rights uh, audit, which means that they had problems with excess work hours or poor working conditions or child labor, uh, et cetera. And so when we looked at this and compared it to the other studies, we thought, what's going on here? Is this simply a problem, like, you know, there's a public relations story, but in fact they're not doing the right thing, or do they not really mean what they're saying, et cetera? And we were, in fact, very impressed in our research by how sincere the people are who work in this area, how hard they work at trying to improve things all up and down uh, the company. And so for us, it seemed to us that the problem was not that this was a lack of will or you know, a lack of, gen, uh, of sincerity, et cetera, by the companies, but there was something inherent in this particular way of tra tackling the problem, which is this compliance um, uh, model. And what we when we look more closely at the compliance model and what is assumed to be driving it, it's a series of assumptions about how the global wor uh, economy works, which in fact turn out not to be so true. The assumptions behind the compliance model is that you have this kind of asymmetry in power between big global buyers and their local developing country suppliers. And the view is that since the global buyers are so much more powerful than their developing country suppliers, that if they just wanted to impose standards, they would be able to do it. It's just a question of will. In the same way that they impose quality standards or cost standards or on-time delivery issues, if they really wanted to tackle environmental and social issues, they could do it because they have the uh, power to do so. That's the first assumption. Anyone who knows anything about global supply chains knows that it's a lot more complicated than that. In industries like, for example, in footwear or say even electronics, some of those global suppliers are much bigger than any of those global buyers. If we're talking about uh, UN UN in China or Pao Chen in uh, Taiwan, or you think about Flextronics or Foxconn, these are enormous companies with a lot of power and a lot of know-how. So the, this kind of overly simplistic view that the buyers can just sort of flip on the switch and get them to do stuff show, is a very simplistic view of how things work. If you go on the other end of the spectrum, for example, in garments, in garments, which, of course, the buyers are, are, are much more strong, are stronger, have many more resources than any of, the, um, any of the local suppliers. But if you actually look at how much capacity is dedicated to one of these global buyers in any one of these apparel factories, it's minuscule. It's about 15% capacity dedicated maybe one season or two without any long-term uh, relationship. So how much leverage this buyer has to force the local supplier to make investments in new technology or work systems, et cetera, is again something that is thrown up. Another assumption is that these audits that are conducted, which are basically an adaptation of financial audits, they basically are sort of checklists where people go in, they're trained to do this kind of social auditing, they go into these factories for a day, maybe two days, and they try to see if they can get a snapshot of the conditions of this factory and think that that is a good way to actually get a sense of what's really going on in this factory. When in fact, something that might be working today is not gonna be working tomorrow or some of the kinds of issues that we're talking about are so complex and subtle that a checklist approach, which is the basis of all these audits, which then lead to corrective action plans, is for the most part inaccurate and often uh, in incomplete. And the third one uh, uh, argument is incentives. 
that basically if buyers really want to basically change their supply chains, they either have to punish their suppliers by reducing their orders, or they can reward them by giving them more orders uh, in terms of creating the right kinds of behavior. But again, in many of these kinds of industries, because of either asset specificity or because of fashion trends or whatever it is, it's very difficult to do that kind of positive and negative rewards in the kinds of industries that we're talking about. So the more we actually looked at not just the two cases that I'm talking about, but many other uh, examples and had all sorts of meetings here at MIT and uh, elsewhere um, bringing industry um, leaders together to talk about it, we realized the whole model of which the, all of this kind of labor and environmental justice is often based is on very, very shaky grounds. It basically assumes a unilin uh, sort of this causal analysis from external pressures to buyers to codes of conduct, et cetera, uh, and that they have these positive feedback loops, which, as I just mentioned, because of the inaccurate assumptions and because of the complexity of the way supply chains work, does not work this way. So what we've been doing in our research is basically uh, realizing that there was a completely different model. What we, as we started doing more of this research, especially the grounded research, we realized given all these theoretical and empirical difficulties, the question shouldn't be, you know, what's wrong with this model and how to improve it. The question should be, given all the structural difficulties in improving anything in these factories, why does any good stuff happen at all? And what was interesting is that we saw many, many, many cases of factories over time improving their labor conditions, their environmental performance, their health and safety performance. And when we try to basically distill what distinguished those factories from the others, it wasn't because of compliance. It wasn't because they were being policed or threatened into changing their behavior, but rather because the buyers and suppliers developed a very different kind of relationship. It was a relationship based on trust, on information sharing, on uh, the analysis of root causes, what driving some of these kinds of issues, of sharing innovation from one supplier to the other. It was a very, very different kind of relationship, which we ended up calling much more a, a commitment approach as opposed to a compliance approach. To give you an illustration, just briefly, of how this works, Going back to uh, Nike, we studied two apparel factories that made exactly the same good. So they made sort of high-tech running uh, t-shirts. So two factories of the same size, of the same age, um, in the same country, having the same unions, paying the same minimum wage, et cetera, sourcing to the same uh, buyers. Um, and what was interesting in Plant A, we had higher wages, uh, better working conditions, uh, much more interesting sort of lean manufacturing, high performance work systems, et cetera. You do have overtime, and by the way, you have overtime everywhere. The question is whether there's, the overtime is within the legal limits and it's voluntary, or whether it's above the legal limits and it's imposed on you. So factory A uh, was a high performer uh, in terms of its working conditions. Factory B was the opposite. It was a very traditional kind of uh, uh, factory, sort of uh, using the bundle system that had, uh, very, uh, had lower wages, uh, much more traditional work system, excess work hours, uh, et cetera. Now, just in truth of advertising, uh, one is a locally owned plant and one is not a locally owned plant. Since we actually had 900 observations and we could try to see whether ownership mattered, I can tell you it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, even though that, uh, just for truth of advertisement, we want to show that there were some differences. What's interesting is notwithstanding that plant A pays more has more modern uh, employment systems and production systems, et cetera, it also has higher productivity and lower unit costs. So in other words, good things can go together. What's interesting is that plant A wasn't always like that. There was nothing genetic about play, plant A being a high performer, both in the labor side and in the production side. Plant A used to have exactly the same production system as plant B. The difference was that it actually started working with its buyer, it turned to Nike and said, you know, I heard there's this thing called lean manufacturing out there. Um, and uh, we're thinking of, um, of maybe sort of adopting some of those practices. Uh, can you help us? And Nike says, well, as a matter of fact, I can help you because I actually have a whole training facility in Vietnam that's trying to sort of roll this out among our, our footwear uh, producers, so let's work together. So the buyers, Nike, worked with the suppliers in the retraining of the workforce, the reorganization of the um, 
of the, uh, of the production system um, and really giving them all sorts of positive incentives, including saying to them, we know as when you make a shift from one production system to another, from one employment system to another, things are going to get worse before they get better. It always happens. But we're going to stick with you. We will guarantee you the same orders during this transition period as long as we see that you're committed to making these investments. Likewise, the supervisors of Plant A turned to the workers and said, we know that as you learn new techniques and as you do this training, your productivity is going to go down and a big part of your bonus is based on uh, productivity. So we will guarantee you 80% of your previous productivity ba uh, bonus as long as you commit to this training uh, efforts and stuff like that. So basically it was a win-win situation. And as a result of that, after a couple months of this reorganization and training and experimentation, Plant A improved not only its productivity and quality and on-time delivery, it was able to actually change its whole production system so it could make smaller batches of different goods, which is what the buyers want anyways, and it was able to actually improve its quality, its, uh, reduce its uh, turnover rate, improve the um, wages, and also the voice of employees. Good things can go together. We already know how to do it. We just have to change our mindset away from a compliance approach to a much more commitment kind of approach uh, of doing that. We saw very similar kinds of developments, not just in Mexico, but in Turkey, in Central America, even in China. We saw a lot of that kind of commitment approach emerging. What I want to um, just uh, argue with you uh, or assert um, in my final slide is to say there are these two different approaches of trying to tackle some very major issues in global supply chains. The traditional one is the compliance approach. It's an us versus them. It's here are the rules, you need to execute them. I'm going to poli police you, and if not, I'm going to threaten you, even if I don't e always execute uh, those uh, threats. And the way that I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on checking you, and if actually you don't perform well, I'll come back and check you some more, and I'm going to make you pay for those audits, et cetera. That's the way that the traditional system has worked, and I would assert it has at best produced mixed results and certainly has not solved in a sustainable way the kinds of labor and environmental problems that continue to plague uh, supply chains in all different industries. Coexisting with that approach is another one, the commitment approach. Now, by the way, the commitment approach relies on uh, aspects of that compliance approach. You need to collect information still. You need to have some kind of threat like, look, if, you don't, if you're not willing to work with me, I, I am going to pull out eventually. So there are some aspects of the compliance approach that still have to be there, but it's a different kind of logic. It's basically working with the suppliers as partners, trying to say, what's the big problem here? Let's stand back. I don't want to, I don't want to just check down the audit list. I want to sort of talk with you about what's really going on here. What are the bigger issues, and how do we solve this together? How do we engage in uh, information sharing and problem solving and actually maybe even building trusting relationships? Those the factories and those relationships between the buyers and suppliers that seem to be embracing this second approach, and I think uh, Bonnie Nixon is going to talk a little bit about this in, uh, in the work that HP is uh, doing, which I think they're really a leader in the second approach, seem to be producing the more sustainable results. This is the kind of grounded, impartial, fact-based research that we're doing here at MIT. They come to us because they know that we're going to be rigorous about what we're doing. We get independent financing to do this kind of research. And after we've done this research, we bring to campus all the different companies, the different NGOs. And by the way, they don't often talk to, to each other. Or if they talk to each other, it's usually sort of at a high level of, uh, of uh, I don't know what the right word would be, certainly a high volume and sometimes not, uh, not in the nicest way. Uh, they often talk past one another. We bring in government agencies, international organizations, and say, look what we're learning. How can we design better systems? That's what MIT is all about, is to try to do rigorous and relevant research to not only inform our education, but to change the world. And I just wanted to give you one example, and you heard others earlier this morning, of what uh, we're doing.